Welcome to Ignite It for Jesus. My name is Robert Pears. I'm glad that you've checked out this mentoring series and that these, these series of messages would really encourage you to live boldly for Jesus in these last days. In this series, we're going to look at how to stir up the gift. Many people have asked me to mentor them, but many also have asked me, how do I live on fire? How do I stir up the gift? How do I stir up my spirit, man? And so I want to answer that in this next series of messages. So go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Hallelujah. And I thank you, Father God, as we enter in your word, Holy Ghost, that you would give us fresh revelation, fresh manna from heaven, and now word that changes us. <clears throat> Father, we come. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, and let us be in tune with your heart and receive all that you have for us, Father, in the name of Jesus. And it says in verse 6, For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. Now, it's hard to imagine that Timothy could come to a place where he has to be reminded. And many of us get to that place of discouragement or whatever has happened, and we need to be reminded. Many of us have to be reminded how to stir up the fire again in us. Uh, you know, it's something you're going to have to do every day, make a choice to stir up that which God has put in you. And he says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but power, love, and soundness of mind. You've been given a spirit of power and love and soundness of mind. You've been given a spirit of fire and power on the inside. We discover, of course, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that we will be given the Holy Ghost. And when He comes, we will be given power to be witnesses. The world is not looking for somebody to stand up and share nice messages from the Scripture. But they're looking for somebody that preaches with power and fire. This generation needs to see people that know how to live boldly by the Spirit for Jesus. Not just bold, arrogant believers, but those that are bold by the Spirit of the living God. You need to learn how to live bold in the Spirit in your prayer life so it's effective and brings forth results. Bold in your message, in your preaching, everything that God's called you to do so that it delivers results that glorify Jesus. So we need to learn how to stir up the gift, how to stir up the fire on the inside of us, how to call forth, you know, deep, calls unto deep. And there's got to be a calling forth in us. But I want you to lay hold of certain things. Number one, get rid of the formulas. You know, many years uh, in ministry, I was taught formulas, and we pray long in the Spirit. And I'm not saying these things are wrong, but when they're done by the formula, they don't produce the results. And we've got to lay hold of certain basic truths. And the first I want to get is, <clears throat> what have you received? Remember that Paul just said, number one, that there was a receiving of a gift so God has put something into you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? I go to many churches and we talk about the Holy Spirit and I see these uh, experiences, touches, you know, the breath and blowing and all this and people falling under the, the Spirit. But I often wonder how much is just a flesh response and how much is it an encounter with the Lord? See, I don't want just a touch and many people settle for a touch or an experience. I want an encounter. And I want to stir you to lay hold and press in to get an encounter with God. Because it's an encounter that changes you. Not just a nice touch. And many people, you know, if there's something going on all around you, often we feel compelled to do something. You know, if everybody is being slain or touched by the Spirit around you and you're not, then all of a sudden, what's wrong with you? And so a lot of times people do it more out of flesh response than out of a real thing. I want you to get an encounter with the Holy Spirit that changes you. And I want you to understand what that means so that you allow the Holy Spirit to be Lord in your life, to bring forth, you know, precious fruit in your life. Oh, glory to God. In John chapter 20, Jesus said this, so Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed in them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. When you, the Holy Spirit, when you receive the Holy Ghost, 
there's always a divine go with it. And I want you to understand there is, of course, the baptism of water, but there's a separate event, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I want to ask you if you received the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Have you received that baptism of fire that has changed you? Because you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, it's not just a breathing in, but it's a receiving Him for who He is, that He's Lord. I look at, you know, many people will receive me, you know, as a believer. They come in, they welcome me, and they receive me. But they refuse to receive me as a minister of the gospel, as a pastor or teacher. No, because they don't recognize. I'm not in their network. I'm not in their church or whatever. And so, yes, they might receive me as a believer, but they don't receive who I am in Christ as a pastor, a minister, etc., and as a consequence, they do not receive of that gift. They shut down that which the Holy Spirit has for them through the gift that God has given me. Remember that God gave gifts unto men. The purpose of those gifts is to be a blessing to the body, to build up the body. What God has put in me is to build up the body of Christ. It's not about me. It's not about my kingdom. It's not about building some great ministry. It's about allowing the Holy Ghost to work through me to build up the body of Christ. So when I receive the Holy Spirit, I don't just receive the person of the Holy Spirit. I receive all that He is. I respect and receive His authority in my life and His ministry. So I enable Him and allow Him to do what He has to do in me. So you have to allow, receive the Holy Spirit and allow Him to do what only He can do. We know, of course, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that the Holy Spirit will transform you. He will do a work and transform you from glory to glory into the image of Jesus so that you will become just like Him. The work that Jesus did on the earth was, of course, done through the power of the Holy Spirit. And He wants to continue that work through you and I. Smith Wigglesworth said, Whatever Luke or Mark meant by Jesus being led or driven by the Holy Spirit, one thing is certain. A power, a majesty, had fallen on Jesus, and he was no longer the same man. He had received this mighty anointing of power, and he realized that the only thing for him to do was to submit. So when you receive, there has to be a submission and a yielding to the Holy Spirit. Jesus, of course, you know, we see 30 years of his life, he, he, he really does nothing. There's no miracles, no great acts of power. But then he goes down, he gets baptized by John. When he comes out of the water, he gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit immediately, what, leads him, drives him into the wilderness. And that's one of the first things the Holy Ghost is going to do in your life, is he's going to drive you to the wilderness to kill the flesh man. You are of no good until he's crucified and destroyed everything of the flesh and everything of the enemy in your life. See, he wants to do a mighty work in you. And we hate that because it's got to bring us to a place of brokenness of ourselves so that now we are fit for the master's use. The old cut off. There has to be that recircumcision of the heart, a change, a transformation. Jesus went through the wilderness you know, a, 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 you know, a desolate place, a place where he had to come to absolute dependence upon God for his protection against the wild beasts, his supply of food and water and everything else. His life was absolutely endangered. And of course, then he is tempted by the enemy. And it's the Holy Spirit in him that enabled him to be successful. And he comes out now in the power of the Holy Spirit, and of course, then he could say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he preached a word that, of course, was a now word that had a power and an unction to bring forth change and transformation. And we need that. I want to be able to give a word in season that has a power to change people, to bless people. So let the Holy Spirit be Lord. Smith Wigglesworth said, Looking back on our spiritual journeys, we will see that we have held on to our own way too much of the time. We, as I look even in my own life, in my own ministry, 
are trained to do things a certain way. And we try to do it by a formula and we end up doing it our way. And we've got to come to a place of surrender, of yielding. And it's not a one-off thing. It is a process. And I want you to get this. It's a process that is done in the secret place where you're going to have to come in and we're going to learn some stuff about this and allow the Holy Spirit to begin a work in you. I want, you know, an immediate result, press the button, it's all done. But I've found that the Holy Ghost has to change me, transform me, and it takes a process. One of the most, you know, let me go back here and say, one day the Lord turned up and he said to me, you are like to me, a David. Oh, and I like that because I like Davids and I've always want God, I want to be a David before you. And he says, but you're also a Jacob. And I understood what he was saying. And that was the hard part. And God wants to kill the Jacob in you. The supplanter, the person who's always trying to do things according to their own ability to make things happen. And while we're trying to do good things, and I was, I was trying to do, be a blessing, do the gift, fulfill the purpose of God, but it was me all the time. And I wonder why there wasn't power. We step into ministry or we start to do the things of God. And it may be a good thing, but it's not covered and just oozing the Holy Ghost so that it is an effective thing and it really honors and blesses God. Smith said, or I'm a, Smith is quoting this and I want to quote this. Amos 3, 3. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? And you cannot walk in and by the Holy Spirit unless you come to a place of agreement where He is Lord. See, He doesn't sit there and barter back and forth to come to a place of agreement. It is a place of yieldedness, of surrender. And you're going to have to learn to yield and yield and yield and yield until that final yielding comes. There is a death that God has got to bring you to. That's why often He brings us first out into the wilderness to bring about a death in you. So you come to that absolute death of the old and the new person comes forth. See, a lot of times the reason we're hurt, the reason that we are discouraged, it's the old man. And God wants to kill that. And a lot of times we got to get pushed back out to the, the wilderness again because what happens? The old man resurrects. You know, I know that we're supposed to call to go out and raise the dead, but stop raising the old man. Kill him, crucify him, and bury him, and leave him there. And it's a challenging thing because so often we go back and we raise the old man. And God has to get us to a place where that old man is finally dead and gone. Smith Wigglesworth said, We cannot enter into the profound truths of God until we relinquish control. For flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit corruption. Let go of the reins. John G. Lake said, I shall never cease to praise God that revealed to me the depth by the Holy Ghost of the power of the blood of Jesus. There is this wonderful thing that God wants to do in you. The Holy Spirit wants to bring you to the place of the power of the blood, of the power of the blood to cover you, to wash you, to change you, to bring you into the place of being an heir and co-heir so that you now surrender and yield. There's a, why would you surrender and yield? Because in that place of surrendering, yielding, you come into sonship and to being an heir and co-heir with Christ. Hallelujah. John G. Lake said, the baptism of the Spirit is the incoming of the, sorry, incoming into the personality of Him, the Holy Ghost, which is the Spirit of Jesus, taking real possession of your spirit or your inner man, of your soul, the mind, the animal life, yea, of your flesh, He possessing the whole being. So God wants to come and, and by the Holy Spirit, take possession of your whole being. Your spirit, your mind, your will, your emotions. And, you know, as I said, I've been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, where so much of my life has been dictated to by my emotions. And I want to bring you to an awareness that a lot of time that God is going to bring you back to a place where you were defeated before, so that this time you gain a victory. And we hate it, you know, that all of a sudden I'm back in the place that I was before. But God is saying, this time I want you to gain the victory. A lot of time we got through by the grace of God 
but we walked and we were defeated and hurt and injured. And God wants you to gain a far surpassing victory so that you have a testimony. So he will bring you back to a place where you were defeated so that this time in the spirit, you gain the victory because there's a place we need to walk in the spirit and by the spirit. And that starts by getting into the secret place and yielding and yielding and yielding. We need a real encounter with the Holy Spirit. In Psalm 76, okay, it says, Thou art more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. The stout-hearted um, are spoiled. They have slept their sleep, and none of the men have found their might, might in their hands. What, what has been said here? The word stout-hearted is actually the inner man. So the inner man is what? Spoiled, defeated. There has to come a place of brokenness where your strength is gone in you and of yourself. And that's a hard place and we will resist and we'll run from it because the flesh man has been taught the law of survival. And of course the law of survival is survival the fittest and you must do everything to survive. It doesn't want to die. Your flesh man doesn't want to die, but you're going to have to make a quality decision to crucify it, to allow the Holy Ghost access to every part of your being, to make Jesus and enthrone him as Lord on the heart of your affection and your imagination. There has to be change. Where is that done? In the secret place. In the secret place. Bonke, Reiner Bonke said this, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not symbolic or ceremonious, simply religious jargon to be used in church liturgy or in a congregational worship. It is the power of the Holy Spirit sent to empower the church for its earthly assignment. Without it, no souls can be saved no matter our efforts. No lasting change can occur in, with, or through the church apart from the Holy Spirit. Without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the church is outmatched by the darkness that pervades the earth and by the tricks of the enemy. And in your own life, you will always be defeated by the enemy if you're not walking in the Spirit, if you're not walking with the power of the Holy Ghost. But there's no reason why you shouldn't. And that's why I'm going to call you to stir up the gift, to stir up the fire inside of you so that you walk always with the fire of the Holy Ghost. Get in the secret place. Now lay hold of this. In Ephesians 1, we discover in verse 6 but that we are accepted in the beloved. Because I want you to know that God wants you and loves you. Get the revelation. God wants you and loves you. He wants you to come in the secret place because he wants, he wants you. He treasures you. He delights in you. Look at this. In verse 12 of Ephesians 1. That we should be to the praise of His glory who trusted in God. God wants to raise you up to the praise of His glory. He wants to boast in you. He wants to brag in you. Catherine Coleman said, If you are a born-again Christian, you are literally a joint heir with Christ. And that comes from the highest authority in heaven and earth. That God settled it in heaven and earth, at the high court of heaven. He settled it before all things, that you are a child of God when you receive what Jesus did on the cross and confess him with your mouth. And he has made you by the Holy Spirit an heir and co-heir with Christ. That gives you such an authority and power. And if you will receive the Holy Spirit according to Romans 8, he will make, and if you will let him lead you, make you a son that you can cry out Abba Father and truly step into your inheritance and come to a place of, of he is for you who can be against you in the old testament there was a powerful place when they understood that God was with them when a hero of faith got hold of that God is with me it changed everything that was the place of power that's where they became you know, supernatural, where they became above and beyond. Why? Because they came to a place where it wasn't them, but the Holy Ghost came on them with an anointing for a purpose. 
God anointed them, and that anointing of the Holy Ghost gave them supernatural abilities to achieve God's purpose. But guess what? You're not in the Old Testament to just get an anointing for a purpose. You've got the Holy Ghost to live in you so that now you can walk and live by the Holy Spirit 24-7 every day of your life. So that, because when the anointing comes on me to preach, it's a wonderful place. But when I step out of the anointing, when I'm not preaching and I've stepped out, I've been there so long that you'd have this Sunday, this glorious Sunday where you preached and the anointing was on you. It was awesome. It's like fire. It's electricity. It's glorious. Then the next day I get up and the counterattack of the enemy came in. I mean, it was just terrible. It was a bad Monday. Why? Because I was living under the anointing. And I, my joy, my peace, and everything was based on the anointing. But you are not based on the anointing. You're based on walking in the Spirit. And if you'll walk in the Spirit, you'll always walk as more than a conqueror. you always walk with the fire, the joy, the peace. And glory to God for those times where you minister and the anointing comes upon you. But I can experience walking in the Spirit 24-7 because of what Jesus did. In the secret place, it's a wonderful place that I want you, it's, it's, it's a position too, where you make a choice of surrender and yielding, of hungering and thirsting, going after God. And it's a place where you have to catch the vision God has for you. Smith Wigglesworth said this, there are two sides of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The first condition is that you possess the baptism. The second condition is the baptism possesses you. The first has to happen before the second can occur. So that you receive the baptism, that's a glorious thing, and that's where most of us quit. But we've got to come to a place where now the baptism of the Spirit, what possesses us? Where we now allow the Holy Spirit who's entered in to fully have control and lordship over us and reveal to us a vision and purpose from heaven. Where has that happened? In the secret place. Where I come when no one else is looking, when no one else sees. I make a decision when I could go and watch a movie, read a book, or do something. God, I'm desperate for you. And I go after him with a hunger and a desperation, a yieldedness and a surrender, and allow the Holy Spirit to do something in me. It's got to go deeper than a simple prayer. This is a desperation. This is a pressing in and going after. It goes beyond because many people will quote Jude and talk about, you know, build yourself up on your holy faith, holy faith by praying in the Spirit. I'm going to say, okay, I understand that people talking in tongues, praying in the Spirit, but it's more than that. Because it's praying in the Spirit. Because I can pray in English in the Spirit. I can pray in tongues. It is walking, talking, praying in the Spirit. It's a life. And it, I have to, in the secret place, learn how to become a son. I have to learn night after night, day after day, going into the secret place, surrendering, yielding, and learning from the Holy Spirit. He is the great mentor and we have to what fix our eyes on Jesus in the secret place are you getting something hallelujah is the Lord ministering to you I mean I know there's a lot of things you're looking for you're looking for a formula and over this series I'm hoping to share a lot of things not a formula but how the secrets that you will learn how to walk and do it Smith said ministers of God are to be flames of fire, nothing less than flames, nothing less than holy, mighty instruments with burning messages, with hearts full of love, with the depths of consecration where God has taken full charge of their bodies and they exist only to manifest for the glory of God. See, we like the first part is I want to be a minister of fire. There's something about when I preach and I love to look at various heroes of faith they may not have had perfect doctrine, but they had such an anointing that they were able to do great things. Whether it was Charles Finney, or I could raise up Dowie, or whatever it may look at. Imperfect men, but did great things because of the fire of the Holy Ghost on the message. But listen, it went on further. There was the depths of consecration. Depths of it. 
That's in the secret place where I consecrate, I yield, I surrender. And God has taken full charge of their bodies. Amen? Now listen to this quote from Smith Wigglesworth. He was, of course, a mighty man that saw phenomenal power in a ministry that went global. The shout cannot come until it is within. The inner working of the, holy, of the power of God must come first. He who changes the heart and transforms the life. Before there's any real outward evidence, there must be the inflow of divine life. What you're looking for outwardly has to start inwardly in the secret place. Do you understand what I'm getting? Do you get that? You are looking for something outwardly. I'm looking for certain power, demonstration, joy, fire. But that comes by the inward work of the Holy Spirit in the secret place as I surrender and yield and go after God. You have to be found in Him. That's the secret place. Listen to this. Ephesians 1, 13. In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed. And there's a wonderful place now where in the secret place you get sealed and you know it. Sealed as a son so that now I pray and it's a praying in. Because how do I know I'm in? There's the sealing. I feel the seal of the Holy Spirit upon me. And it's a wonderful, that is the place I want to pray. That's where I want to pray in the Spirit because I feel the seal. That's where I want to minister because I feel the seal. I'm not waiting. See, when I receive the Holy Ghost, I receive power. But I discovered that in the secret place, I surrendered, allowed this vessel not to be used by Him. And He was able to put a seal upon me and now I can stand in Him, be found in Him, and I can pray in Him. I can walk in Him. And I want you to get to the place where you know that. That's a glorious place where you know it by the inward man, not your emotions or your mind. You know that you know that you know, and there's a confidence no matter what happens. Catherine Coleman says, there are times when we feel so independent, so self-sufficient, and then in awe of our self-sufficiency, we get ourselves into serious trouble. Catherine Coleman proved that by making some big blunders. And I've been there myself, where you get to a place where you see promises, you see, and we, in the flesh, I am this, I am a son of God, I am, you know, a pastor, a teacher, I am this. And we move forward in our own ability, in our own confidence, in our own strength, and we get ourselves in a whole lot of trouble. Instead of in the secret place of yielding till the Holy Ghost, that ceiling is fully on. We've surrendered. Oh, glory to God. Philippians 3, 9. And you may be found in Him. If you're looking for me, I'm found in Him. You're going to have to make it such a way of living that people now, when they're looking for you, they recognize you're found in Him. And stay in that place. Listen, in Galatians 5, 16 through 18. But I say, walk in or by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of your flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. You either are bowing to your flesh, or you're bowing to your spirit. Your flesh, man, will always keep you in a place of emotional roller coaster, where at some points it's great and you're high, and then there are times you're discouraged and you're depressed. But your spirit, man, Listen, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And in verse 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit, the consequence, the, the proof of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such thing there is no law. When I walk in the Spirit, there is an evidence. There is a fruit that comes forth of peace and joy and love. These things come forth. 
and they are not dependent upon circumstances because they're not built upon me, they're built upon the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the greatest force in the universe, in all creation. He brought, when God spoke, let there be, the Holy Spirit took that word, hovered over it, and produced it. The infinite complex laws of the universe and everything that exists, the Holy Spirit took that and brought it all into existence. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead and He's made available to you. And we can learn to walk in the Spirit in the secret place. In Galatians 5.25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. If we're led as a son, now as a son, not alone do I recognize who I am, but now I learn how to walk in a life yielded, surrendered by the Holy Spirit. The word walk is a military march or conduct of discipline, of me walking under the discipline of the Holy Spirit in every area. And I don't always like that because sometimes I want to eat the donut and he says, no donut for you. Or no this or that. We want to appease the flesh. Or we want to do this or that. And like, no. And we have to learn in the simple or complex or whatever it may be, where the Holy Spirit says, no, don't do it. When the Holy Spirit says, do this, do that. But I don't want to do that. Do it. There's times I get out of bed, he says, jump for joy, dance, sing, start praising. I don't want to. Do it. You discover afterwards the critical reason why he had you do that. There were some breaking, some things, you know, the enemy was going to throw at you and he wanted you ready, filled with the joy, strong in the Holy Ghost. Now, as you spend time in the secret place, as you in the secret place, you enter the word, Holy Ghost, open this thing to me. Holy Ghost, you wrote this, now speak it to me. Give me revelation. Give me eyes to ears to hear so that it does something in me. As you receive that, begin to give it. What you get in the secret place, as God pours into you, begin to pour forth. Because what? Remember that Jesus said that out of our innermost being in John 7, rivers of living water would flow and speak of the Holy Spirit. Smith Wiggles were said, His ministers are to be flames of fire. It seems to me that no man with a vision, especially a vision by the Spirit's power, can read those wonderful verses without being kindled to such a flame of fire for the Lord uh, that it seems as if it would burn up everything that would interfere with this progress. So now, God wants to send you as a minister of fire, but you've got to learn to give what God is putting into you to allow it to come forth from you. I've said this before, you know, a lot of times I start to get revelation and I would hold on to it. And my pastors, you know, told me one day, if you hold on to it, you stop the flaw. Just as these giant trees, they don't have a heart pumping the water, but the water flows as each water molecule is pulled one by one, and it gets to the leaf where it is released. It is pulled out by the air. As it pulls out, it pulls the next one, and it pulls the next one. And this constant pulling causes the water to come up through the whole tree, watering it. So there has to be a giving. It has to be releasing. And as it releases, more water is drawn up. If it stops the release, the water stops flowing. If you want the fire, if you want the Holy Ghost, as you get into the secret place, let it begin to flow from you. Let the joy begin to come out of you. Start to walk in love. Start to do what the Holy Ghost is sharing with you. As He gives you revelation, begin to allow it to come forth. As he tells you to do, begin to do. Because as you start to act and flow and yield and allow those things to come forth, you kindle. You kindle that fire and you will start to become a vessel, a minister of flame. I want to finish with this. Hebrews 1.7 And out of the angels, he said, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. God wants to make you a flame of fire in the secret place. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Holy Ghost, just touch them, open eyes to see, ears to hear, and pour into them right now. And let it come forth from them in Jesus' name.
Hallelujah. Thank you and be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.